Joining me now is House Democratic Leader Hakeem Jeffries of New York. And, you know, I, I do want to get to the um, very most important thing we have to talk about, which is, of course, the debt ceiling uh, and the debt limit. But I do need to talk about Kevin McCarthy. Um, because today he couldn't even answer a very straightforward question about probably the most embarrassing member of his caucus, George Santos. I just want to play that for you just for a moment. I think I would like the House to take up this work and look at it. And if it rises to that occasion, then because as we look to all these difference, I mean, we just had a report come out from Durham. What does that say about Adam Schiff? He lied to the American public. Should he be expelled from Congress as well? That, that, OK, first of all, that is insane. Uh, Adam Schiff is barely mentioned in the Durham report, three sort of passing mentions of him. He is not at issue here. Um, and that is who you all are negotiating with about the debt limit. Is he taking the debt limit more seriously than he's taking the presence of a potential felon in his caucus? Well, first of all, it's great to be with you, Thank you. Joy. You know, George Santos is a serial fraudster. He uh, does not belong anywhere near the House of Representatives. He defrauded the people of the 3rd Congressional District in New York, lied about everything, lied about his life, lied about his jobs, lied about his finances, lied about his professional experiences, lied about being Jewish. He perpetrated a fraud on the people of New York. He was elected under false pretenses. And so I commend Congressman Garcia uh, for bringing this privileged resolution forward. And the real question is, are House Republicans going to stand on the side of truth or stand on the side of George Santos? It's important to mention, Santos was referred to the Ethics Committee months ago. Right. So what are we doing? You're either going to hold him accountable under the Constitution, or you're not. It's going to be interesting to see how the so-called moderates, in terms of New York House Republicans, vote. Right. They've all said that they want him out, right. that he doesn't belong in the House of Representatives. Tomorrow, they will have an opportunity to vote their word. So that is going to come to the floor, right? And, that, and as you said, you're going to find out, we will all find out whether House moderates, to the extent that there are any House moderates left in the Republican Party, will vote him out. Um, but on the debt limit, there is, in theory, a way that you could bring a privileged re resolution to see how serious those same House moderates are about averting a, an economic catastrophe. That's what Janet Yellen, uh, the Treasury Secretary, said. It would be a disaster for every person in this country economically. It would cause a recession, et cetera. Do you believe that there are enough Republicans who would vote if you did a privileged resolution to force a vote on whether or not we should allow ourselves to crash over the debt limit? Well, that's an open question and remains to be seen, although I do think that we're going to have to probe those Republicans and they should be held accountable uh, for their positions that were previously taken, which is to vote with the extremists on the Default on America Act, right. which would dramatically cut Medicaid spending for disabled children and seniors in their golden years, dramatically cut education, dramatically cut public safety funding, dramatically cut health care, dramatically cut food and nutrition assistance, draconian cuts that the American people find objectionable all across the country. And, you know, we were essentially given a choice by some of the extreme MAGA Republicans, accept the Default on America Act or accept an actual default that would destroy millions of jobs, crash the stock market, hurt retirees, and skyrocket costs. Neither of those two choices are acceptable. And I think in the meeting today, which was positive mm -hmm. because it was cordial, it was candid, and there's a potential path forward, Leader Schumer, President Biden, myself, we all made clear the fault is not acceptable, and neither is a take it or leave it approach. The Washington Post reports that in that meeting that you were all in, um, the Democratic side, perhaps even yourself, offered up closing tax loopholes. You, you, you hear a lot of talk from Republicans about we need to close excessive loopholes. That was rejected summarily. That is what the Washington Post reports. Is that accurate? Well, it is accurate that we had a real conversation about the appropriate way to deal with the deficit. President Biden produced the budget in March. It's a budget that will strengthen and protect Social Security. It's a budget that will build an economy that works for everyday Americans and 
reduce the deficit by $3 trillion by doing things like closing tax loopholes for big pharma, closing tax loopholes for big oil, uh, and finding other areas where you can eliminate that type of waste or fraud or abuse. And the Republicans indicated they had a different perspective about it. Right. But our view is you can't have a real conversation about deficit reduction if you want to take revenues and closing tax loopholes off the table. Right. And again, we're not interested in a take it or leave it approach. And that was made clear. Is, is, is a privileged resolution on the table, is this something you're seriously considering, meaning going around Kevin McCarthy and simply forcing a vote on the floor about an up or down limit, a debt limit increase? Well, my view is that all options have to be on the table, and we've got to explore every opportunity to avoid a catastrophic and dangerous default. So one of the options that could be available to us uh, is a discharge petition. Right. Now, that doesn't... That doesn't go live until tomorrow, and we'll have to have a conversation about the best way to proceed, but it will require not just the signatures of 213 Democrats, but as you pointed out in your opening question to me, we'd also have to find at least five Republicans right. to do the right thing. And my view is, look, we should just be able to find common ground with the fierce urgency of now, because a dangerous default will be bad for everyone. Right. And this is a reckless thing. We have a constitutional responsibility to protect the full faith and credit of the United States of America. It can't be done in a hostage-taking situation. It seemed to be a better approach taken by my Republican colleagues in the meeting today in understanding the urgency of moving forward. And it was agreement that there is no way out of this manufactured crisis unless we can reach a bipartisan agreement about moving forward. Our view continuing to be that the debt ceiling should be raised in a clean way, consistent with what was done under Democratic presidents and Republican presidents. But of course, we can have a simultaneous conversation about the budget, about appropriations, because we do that every year. Right. In determining What's the right mix of spending and revenue and investments to protect the health, safety and well-being of the American people? I do have to ask you just about dealing with this caucus. I mean, you do have Paul Gosar, who's employing a white nationalist, who yeah. himself has made some white nationalist uh, commentary that, you know, you would think 10 years ago, even a, a Republican would be shoved out of Congress or forced out. He's still there. You have the Matt Gateses of the world. You have um, Marjorie Taylor Greene and others who are out vocally supporting um, the choking death. Um, of Jordan Neely, which yeah. has been determined in your state of New York, my home state of New York, as being a homicide. Um, and they're out vocally supporting him, as is a former colleague of yours in the House, Ron DeSantis, the current governor of Florida. And I, I would find it difficult to work with people under those circumstances. But I wonder what you make of this rush to support vigilantism before there's even been an adjudication of that Jordan Neely case. Extreme MAGA Republicans portray themselves as the party of law and order. That's phony, that's fake, that's false. Uh, they continue to demonstrate that they are the party of lawlessness and disorder. That's why they're supporting Santos. That's why they're, they appear to be supporting vigilante action. They've done this before. They did it in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, this is who they are. They want to defund the FBI. They want to impeach the FBI director, who, by the way, was appointed by Donald Trump. Uh, but at the end of the day, they bend the knee to the insurrectionists in chief. They've become, in large measure, the party of Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gosar, George Santos, and, of course, um, former President Donald Trump. That's who they are. Right. That's the reality. They are extreme. And it's our hope that we can find some reasonable Republicans on the other side of the aisle to help get us out of this default crisis and to figure out the common ground to move forward in a way that respects freedom and liberty and justice for all people. I have Not just the privileged few. I do have to ask about one more New Yorker, Alvin Bragg, who has become a focus um, for Republicans. And they always throw in George Soros, another New Yorker, um, who they love to demonize. Um, what do you make of this constant second guessing of his decisions on who to prosecute and who not to prosecute when it comes to both the uh, man who strangled Jordan nearly or choked Jordan nearly and also obviously Donald Trump? Well, 
The extreme MAGA Republicans have clearly been directed to go after Alvin Bragg um, because they're just bending the knee uh, to the insurrectionist in chief who has ordered them, apparently, uh, to try to demonize Alvin Bragg because he doesn't want to face the music. Uh, but I think Alvin Bragg is a good and decent man. He's got an extraordinary track record in law enforcement, former federal prosecutor, exemplary record. And I believe he's going to continue to follow the facts, apply the law, be guided by the Constitution, and present the information uh, to the jury, present the information to the American people, and then we can all make our own decisions about the way forward. But no one in America is above the law. That includes the former president. Yeah. Uh, privilege. Uh, can I ask one completely unserious question? Yes. But it's serious to me and Spike Lee. Next year, do the Knicks go further? Absolutely. Listen, it was a great season. It was. I'm so proud of them. Uh, it, it was a joy. New York is on fire when okay. the Knicks are on fire. And I'm looking at, you know, an Eastern Conference championship next year. They, they have broken my heart my whole life. So I need them to start <laughs> to, you know, but I, they did very well this year. That's right. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, House Democratic Leader, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries of the great state of New York. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Up next on the readout. Joining me now is Andrea Reyes, an immigration attorney in Florida. And I will note for you, Ms. Reyes, that the exception to being able to transport undocumented migrants is the governor who has been authorized by this law to fly migrants from Texas, whom he's brought into the state and put on planes and flown them to all sorts of blue states. So he gets to do it. What is the impact of this law before it even goes into effect in July? Thank you for having me. So right now we are already seeing a um, basically the start of what's going to likely be a mass exodus of immigrants out of the state of Florida. Um, and we understand that um, in the state of Florida, we, we you know, we are 21 percent of the state is populated by immigrants. And so when you have a state where 35 percent of entrepreneurs are immigrants, contributing a whopping 8.1 billion in total income to the state of Florida, when you have over 21 percent of the populations being foreign born, where you have over half a million U.S. citizens living with at least one undocumented family member in their home in a mixed status environment. Um, you know, when you have a, a state that is run by immigrants in the industries of crop production, agriculture, construction, roofing, uh, taxi drivers, and um, uh, maids and housekeepings, right? When you have a state that is run so much by immigrants, to say that this bill is going to affect nearly all residents, families, and businesses in the state is really a terrifying fact. And, and, you know, and it's interesting because you, you, you talk about the number of um, immigrant entrepreneurs in Florida. I definitely experienced that. I lived down there 14 years. You have a lot of people who own construction firms and restaurants. And these are people who are Latino, right? They are themselves. And a lot of them are Republicans and DeSantis supporters have probably voted for him. I want to read a quote from the same article that quoted you um, in The New Yorker. And this was a quote from a gentleman named Jose Rodriguez, and he's a priest in the Iglesia Episcopal Jesus State Nazaret Church in Orlando. He said that conservative Latinos are prioritizing abortion over immigration and other life-preserving issues. Rodriguez, who supports immigration rights, added, they make a good show of pretending that they care about immigrants. But at the end of the day, they worship at the altar of conservatism, and they'll turn their back on their neighbor. Um, but what I've been seeing on, on, you know, on these sort of TikToks that are putting up is people saying that a lot of people who actually voted for DeSantis and thought that he would be a good governor are actually waking up to the fact that this isn't helping them. Are you seeing that kind of reaction from Latinos? So I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. We tend to be a little bit more on the conservative side as a whole. Um, I do definitely believe, you know, Jackson was a bit of a purple city, if you will, um, not quite uh, blue like Orlando or what Miami used to be, uh, you know, prior to this past election. Um, but I definitely think so having this experience with, you know, I've been doing immigration for nine years, working in immigration for 13 years. And I will tell you that the, um, particularly the Hispanic Latino immigrant, right? Because there's different types of immigrants. Yes. Um, in Jacksonville, for example, we have we are a majority minority city. Um, we have six to seven percent um, Asian population, almost eleven to twelve uh, Hispanic Latino, and thirty to thirty thirty three to thirty four um, African American Black population. So we are actually a majority uh, minority city, but our politics don't reflect that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, having already seen a couple of, um, election cycles here, right. What I, what I can tell you is that the immigrant 
particularly the Hispanic Latino immigrant is not monolithic, right? They, they, they're not attached to one particular issue. And um, because traditionally people have, you know, we come from countries where, where religion is a, is, a, is a very strong, it has a very strong um, uh, hold on our households. Um, they tend to vote for things that don't necessarily protect their immediate interests. Um, and so, and, and that's something that I started a nonprofit called Nefida that we're trying to work to educate the immigrant population on like, this is the way that our political system works. Um, this is how, you know, when you come to this country, you got to leave aside your political baggage from your country. Unfortunately, a lot of these immigrants that come from, uh, you know, uh, uh, like uh, states that have been very pol uh, polarized, where there's been a lot of um, corruption and collusion, um, they tend to vote a very specific way because they're trying to avoid having that here, not understanding sure. how our constitution works, separation of powers, federalism. Um, you know, so we're trying to educate the population with that as well, because we do see this to be a, a, a part of a lack of education more than anything else. And th there's also just the actual fear that people are feeling. I mean, if you're afraid to go to the hospital, then that's dangerous and it can lead to people dying. Are you concerned that people are going to be so fearful that if they don't leave, um, you may actually start to see real health crises in the state? So I actually so you 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 said it, you hit the nail on the head. Um, I I genuinely believe that this bill is economic suicide. Um, SB 1718 is a sucker punch to Florida's future, its businesses, families, immigrant communities, and their loved ones. It's going to reduce road uh, safety, and it's going to keep people away from the hospitals. Um, what's what's very bothersome about this bill, right, is that it has all these provisions, but then it has ways to backpedal. So, so for example, for the hospital provision, um, once they report that information to the governor and the legislature, once the hospitals are required to submit those quarterly reports, there's actually a section where they're allowed to elect if the person declined to answer. So that's specifically written to the bill as a possibility. But if you ask an immigrant your immigration status at a hospital, and they're going to feel fearful to give that information to, to even con continue seeking uh, medical attention, despite the fact that you can decline to answer. Um, so absolutely, immigrants by nature already don't report crimes. Right. Uh, there's a specific type of bill called, um, there's, there's been legislative acts, but in 2008, right, there was a, in 2000, there was a bill to help immigrants who were victims of crime come yeah. forward to uh, talk about criminal activity. And because they, because they, you know, inherently they're don't, so yeah. they're afraid. And so now we have hospitals and we have uh, police officers that are going to be acting as ICE officers. And it's going to create, you know, what this Chaos. bill just was designed to do, which is fear mongering. Absolutely. Yeah. It's designed to create fear and also to strip work sites of workers in the state with the most hurricanes in America where they need people to do construction. It makes no sense. And it is also incredibly cruel. Andrea Reyes, thank you for coming uh, to you. talk with us this evening. Cheers. Thank you. And come